Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Excited for scale? Yes. I am. So, first off, show of hands, how many people knew what Holtlook was before they saw this talk? Oh, wow. Surprising number. Um, how many of you knew that Holtlook is almost entirely powered by PHP? <laughs> so, former Holtlook guys definitely know that. So, uh, welcome to Holtz Performance, Cracking the Flash Tail. I am Joel Salas. I am lead platform engineer at Holtlook. And what that means is that I lead the group that does all kinds of stuff, everything that you'd call traditional ops, all the way through to writing actual bits and pieces of software to make the developers' lives better. We do everything. So first off, uh, what is the flash sale? Um, I would show of hands, who knows what a flash sale is in theory? If you've ever used Woot, if you've used Holtlook, Rulala, Gilt, there's lots of shops out there. Basically, the idea of the flash sale is brands, companies will sell us things that they want us to sell on our website at a significant discount, and we will run what we call a sale event, and those usually happen at 8 a.m. and 1 p.m., sometimes 4 p.m., and what that means from a technical standpoint is that we're going to have a uh, stampeding horde of members storming our site at, uh, very, in a very, very narrow time window. We could have up to... Um, 100, 120,000 users on the site concurrently. And this will all happen in the space of about one to two minutes. So it's a lot of traffic very fast, and there's not a lot of technology stacks that can stand up to this. So um, 10 plus seconds is how long it took to load the homepage on Holtlook.com when I started there in 2013. So that's 10 Mississippis just to see uh, if the thing you want is even in stock, and add another 10 seconds to get the product, and add another handful of seconds to get to the cart, and just keep adding them up, and you're well into a minute before you can even check out, and that's just walk clock time on the server. So the outcome, of course, is that we were having barbecues in the data center, right? All of our servers are basically on fire. They're screaming for help. They're like, why are you making us do this, right? What's going on? Please fix your shit. So, uh, unfortunately, that's a uh, negative member experience. That means you're trying to shop. You want that Kate Spade bag. I know all of you love Kate Spade bags and you want to shop them. So, you want that bag. You want that specific bag. You want it in pink. And you're shopping. You're trying to get to the website. It's holding you up. You try to buy it, and now it's sold out. And you're wondering, was I too slow or was the site too slow? So that's a poor experience. And uh, they definitely let us know in the uh, app feedback and on, <laughs> on our uh, member care uh, websites and the whole nine yards. So also you have stakeholders that are extremely unhappy. You have someone in marketing who's been working two months to get Diane von Furstenberg back on our site after the last time it fucked up. And all of a sudden, here we are, it's like crashes on the day of, and uh, there's a, not a lot of confidence in the tech org at that point. And finally, this is pretty bad for the engineers that are supposed to be running this thing. You're doing your best, you're trying to do a good job, you take pride in your work, and you know, regardless of what you do, the site is still slow. So what about today? Um, I have a nice graphic for you. I will tell you uh, as much as I can about it. Uh, this is a screenshot from New Relic, and this is actually a, a Symfony framework app. And our average web transaction time is hovering around 200 milliseconds. And that's a significant drop <laughs> from 10 plus seconds per API call. Um, and uh, the average throughput before the sale event is around 8,000 requests per minute. During the flash sale event, it will go up to about 30, 32, 34. So we're talking a, a quadruple um, in uh, throughput in within a matter of about one to two minutes. And remember, this is all Symfony. This is all PHP. So the obvious question here um, is, how did we do it? How did we get to these flash sale numbers? 100,000 origin hits per minute. Uh, 2.3 million um, Nginx log events per hour, orders up to 250 orders per minute. So if I do some very complicated arithmetic, that's almost four orders per second, uh, just about. And uh, the, the short answer is that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, lots and lots of low-hanging fruit. And um, I'd love to sit here and tell you the saga of all of the things we did and tried and all the trials and tribulations, dark days, but really that's not as useful as uh, what I think uh, you guys want to know which is, what were the practices? What were the learnings? What do we do now that we didn't do then, to harken back to um, you know, our first DevOps talk today? What are we doing nowadays? And so um, I brainstormed with the team, gathered up as much information I could about what we do and why, and
their commandments because I command you to do them, and if you don't, you will not have good performance. So let's start with the principles of performance. The very first one, it's most important, identify and resolve the biggest bottlenecks first. This is very, very important. And it also implies a lot of stuff that we're about to talk about. But if you're working on uh, the bottleneck that is not the biggest bottleneck, you are wasting your time. Because what will happen as you are um, trying to debug this application is that you'll be spot fixing things over here that have basically no impact because you're all bottlenecking in one place. So it doesn't matter how long it takes you to get to that bottleneck. That bottleneck is still the slowest, worst part of your application. So if you imagine uh, with me a, a structure diagram where you have users on the far left, you have your web front end, you have your back end API, and then on, on the right you have your e-commerce database, or any database really, and um, you imagine the flow of data through the system, you can actually have bottlenecks anywhere along the line. But um, in experience, my experience, other people's experience, most of your issues are going to happen over here. They're going to happen on the data side. They're going to happen on the API side. Your web stuff, yes, you can have slow JavaScript, but those things are not as endemic. They're easier to fix than having to go back and you know, redo uh, hundreds of millions of records worth of historical data to fit a new schema, stuff like that. That's very, very challenging to do. And so after you're debugging these bottlenecks and you're tackling the, the biggest one first, another one's going to crop up, right? And so after a while, you're going to start to feel like Hercules slaying the Hydra, right? Every time you, you know, chop off one head, you're going to see three more grow. How do you deal with this sort of thing? Um, I suggest you do what Hercules did, which is burn the stump. Make sure that nothing else can crop up there again. And so what that really means is get down to the bottom of why you have a performance problem. Get to the root cause and fix the root cause. And that might not always be possible, and so you will have to make some trade-offs. But as much as you can, you must eliminate root causes. Second principle, choose and use your tools or make your own. And uh, pretty much what we're talking about here is uh, tools that you're going to use to um, inspect your application, understand what it's doing, and make sure that it's doing what you expect. Um, you must use an application performance monitoring tool. And I know that here we're very FOSS friendly. We don't like saying that uh, sometimes there is a better paid solution but pay for the software, please. Use New Relic, use App Dynamics, use anything. Don't just rely on StatsD or whatever instrumentation you've made. You need something that someone else has spent all of their time working on to make good, right? And right alongside there, uh, you must profile your applications. So what the, applica what the APM will do for you is help you identify where there might be an issue with your code. And what the profiler will do is help you drill into that performance problem and understand why it's there and potentially get a fix. And so once you have um, found an issue, you've debugged it, you think you fixed it, make your servers cry with load tests. Absolutely be confident. Extremely performance sensitive, fix that spot. 
whatever things you do there to make it work, to get it under a number, let's say you must get it under 50 milliseconds, do disgusting, nasty things, but keep them there and keep them contained. Make sure that everyone is aware that the card endpoint is nasty. Be careful looking in there. There's lots of tests around there. It's not going to make sense when you look at it, but it's extremely fast, and we like that. But again, that's not the rule. And uh, here I have an image of who, who is a Simpsons fan? Anybody? Might have heard of this show. Um, I have an image of old Simpsons, uh, Homer and his uh, self-designed car, which is a lovely green pistachio color and has all kinds of bells and whistles on it. And um, that's what happens when you do not make engineering trade-offs. You don't understand uh, what, the, what the problems are and what the solution should be. You try to please everybody, you end up pleasing nobody, and your solution costs $80,000. So next principle, limit the total work done. In other words, when you do work, do it as rarely as you can. Do not do it over again. In other words, you're going to want to reuse computation whenever possible. So cache everything. Cache SQL queries. Cache JSON blobs. Cache documents. Cache entire HTML results. Cache everything. Throw things into memcache and set a, a sensible uh, lifespan for them. Reuse things everywhere you can. And this is gonna, not going to be informed by technical constraints. It's going to be informed by your application. So you must know what is safe to cache and when, and when to show someone a stale result versus a, um, versus a fresh one. Uh, and along those lines, use a caching proxy. Everyone in here should be using a caching proxy. Who is not using a caching proxy? I see some hands. Um, we use Varnish. Varnish is the single greatest thing that saved our website. Thank you, Travis Hansen. And uh, the reason is that we were spending lots of CPU time redoing expensive calls. Um, on Holtlook.com for a given events call, it might take six or seven seconds and about 300 queries to traverse the taxonomy and generate this giant JSON blob. And we only need to regenerate it when events change, which as we said, is 8 a.m., 1 p.m., and sometimes 4 p.m. And so do you think our database knows when that's going to expire? Yes. Do you think our API can set a caching header for Varnish to know when to expire it? Double yes. So if you include Varnish as part of your development lifecycle. If you include this concept of caching everything you can, you're actually going to end up with a significantly reduced need for capacity because Varnish will be doing most of the heavy lifting. And uh, finally, use a content delivery network. Um, Edgecast, Akamai, whatever you choose to use, this is significantly important because you will not be reusing, uh, sorry, you will not be re recalculating all of the work that we've done. For the same reasons that you want to use Varnish, use a CDN and it will actually make your members' experience better due to geolocation of caches and other nice features that they give you for the arm and a leg that they're going to charge you and virgin blood and first ports and so on. Uh, next principle. This is pretty big and it ties into the, to the previous concept. Choose technologies that are designed to scale. Not everything is designed to scale. Some things, like we said, are a trade-off. They're easy to write software in, but they're not designed to scale. Conversely, some things are very challenging to write in and they scale very nicely. So in this case, I'm endorsing the use of things that might be trickier but are designed for scale. And I know that a lot of developers don't like to think in terms of Varnish when they're writing their APIs, but Varnish is designed for scale. It actually prevents a stampeding herd problem, which I'm not sure if everybody knows about. But if you have a 1,000 clients or n number of clients connecting to your Varnish server and they're requesting one resource, which usually is a URL, then Varnish will consolidate those make them wait and fire off one backend call to your API server. It will take that result and send it back to those 1,000 clients, and they're none the wiser. So you just got 1,000 times more servers for free, and it's going to cache it for you. So you might not actually revisit that server for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. And this is probably the most controversial part. I've been talking about PHP for, for now. But you might want to rewrite expensive pieces of your app with appropriate technologies. And so in that case, for us, that meant that our search implementation, which is written in PHP, it's using Doctrine, it's using Symfony, was very, very slow. And fortunately, it's a fairly isolated endpoint. It doesn't impact a lot of other things. So we actually rewrote the entire thing in Scala, and it is significantly faster. It is significantly more scalable, and we use significantly less servers. I'm not sure how many more times I can say significantly, but it is important. So. Those are the principles of performance. And again, these are things that you want to pepper into your designs um, in stack rank, of course. And where, um, where it gets a little less negotiable are the three performance commandments. And again, these are things that you must do 
regardless of how you choose to tackle your performance problem, regardless of what it is. The first performance commandment, know thy system. And so what do I mean when I say know thy system? It means that your app is running on something. What is it? Whether it's Windows, whether it's Linux, FreeBSD, it doesn't matter. Know it well. Know it inside and out. Have an expert on staff that can help you debug these problems. Because if you're building on a shaky foundation, you're not going to get anywhere with it. Second commandment. Know thy runtime. Know it exceptionally well, whether it's PHP, Java, Ruby, Python, doesn't matter. Understand what the limitations are and understand what you can do about those limitations. Know what your frameworks are good at. Know what they're actually really bad at. And these are things that where you have to, you cannot have any um, strong opinions uh, strongly held. They must be strong opinions weakly held because you will be challenging your assumptions regularly. Third commandment, know your application. This is something that no one else can do for you. So when I say know the application, that means understand who is using it, understand what their behavior patterns are, understand what that means for your application. Are carts more expensive than looking at events? Are product pages particularly challenging because there's so many of them? You need to know how they're being used before you can possibly uh, debug and uh, appropriately act on a performance problem. So first commandment, know your system. In our case, we're using Linux. We're using CentOS Linux. 6 and 7, and we're very happy with it. Um, <clears throat> this is a little controversial. I know that we're talking about performance, not talking about manageability. Again, we're talking about trade-offs. Choose bare metal wherever possible. This is really, really important. I know that rubs some people the wrong way. Don't use containers. Don't use virtual machines. Use bare metal. This is the absolute fastest way to run your software. You don't want anything between your runtime and the metal. And again, this is when you're tuning for performance. This is when you have Black Friday coming up. You have no other options. You don't like this option, but you're going to install PHP on all of your virtual machine hosts, and you're going to run PHP right on the box. Second, uh, for know thy system, is tune the kernel. The kernel, by default, is very conservative and gentle with your hardware. It thinks your hardware is brittle. We know better. Get aggressive with the kernel, uh, kernel tuning, and you will be much, much happier with it. And um, I'd like to take a break here to give you a short story. When I started a whole look, we had a big, big problem with connecting to our MySQL database. We got lots of PHP errors to the tune of MySQL servers gone away, you know, connections dropped, stuff like that. And necessarily, all of our investigation goes right to the, right to the server box. We're tuning, we're changing parameters in the kernel. We're trying to figure out why this thing is dropping connections like crazy, right? Um, turns out, the caller was in the house the entire time. The problem was never on the servers. It was actually on the clients. So when PHP is connecting to MySQL and given a default kernel, it will actually use up all of the ephemeral ports it has available. And when PHP tries to make a new connection to run another SQL query, it's actually going to get a timeout. And that's where you get the MySQL gone away error. And I'd like to thank Travis Hansen back there for that. He spent three months of his time figuring out what the hell was going on there. And so what we actually ended up doing was using uh, a kernel flag called TCP uh, TW reuse, set that to one. That means it will reuse existing connections. It will not create new ephemeral ports. All of a sudden, problem solved and the website's so much faster. Funny, funny how that works. So um, that's just one value. Uh, if you want to tackle all these values all at once, you're going to want to use a tool called TuneD for sensible defaults. It will give you a profile that you can um, apply, and it's got a number of them like virtual guest, virtual host, you're going to want latency performance, and that's very, very important. So the, 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 the latency is what you want. You don't care about throughput or other issues. Um, so I'm going to skip some stuff here. Let's go to uh, knowing your runtime. In our case, it's PHP. I've had people come up and tell me, I didn't think PHP could be fast. You are right. It can't. <laughs> PHP is very, very slow because it does a lot of stuff. Um, but first thing you want to do to make PHP faster is use recent versions. Uh, in some cases, you'll see, in some workloads, you'll see that it's going to be actually twice as fast. So if you're on a legacy version of PHP, this is the absolute first thing you want to do. Get that PHP upgraded. Even 5.5 to 5.6 is going to be good. 7 should blow us away. So we'll see. We shall see. Um, second about knowing your runtime is frameworks are inherently slow. They speed development, but they hog resources. And uh, particularly here, we're, we're talking about doctrine. And so doctrine for the uninitiated is an ORM that is commonly used for um, for PHP installs. It is actually the single biggest thing that uses CPU anywhere in our environment. Um, so 
further along those lines, PHP eats CPU. Eats it. You heard it here first. It eats lots of it. So what you're going to want to do when you're performance sizing with PHP is think in terms of concurrency, not in terms of throughput. Sorry. Think in terms of concurrency, not in terms of throughput. So throughput is a post facto measure of what your server did. Concurrency is what it is doing at any given time. So I'm going to give you the ultimate performance tuning formula for PHP. You're going to take the number of physical CPUs on your host. You're going to divide by the average response time in seconds. And what that's going to equal is the total number of PHP workers you can run on that box at any given time. And what that means is that for every single request that comes in and wants some CPU time, it will get CPU time. It will not wait. Because if you have a ton of requests coming in, they will immediately start to snowball, and you will actually end up stealing CPU from each other. And this is not even in a virtualized environment. This is actually in a, a physical host. You will actually have the PHP thread steal CPU from each other. So if you do all this math, and you're like, wow, that doesn't seem like a lot. I know I'm going to have more than that many users on the site. Uh, buy more servers. There's no other option. You need more hardware than you have. That is how you, perform, that is how you capacity plan. So finally here, knowing your application. And I alluded to this earlier, but um, you want to focus on the parts that make you money. The parts that make you money are the most important parts. So if you have a performance problem with the happy path in your application, focus on that first. The critical path must be fast. And um, I'm going to close here with, a, I think, the best, finest example of product-focused engineering that, that uh, uh, we've had at Holdlook. Um, as part of knowing your application, take cues from user behavior. Um, I have for you a tale of too many carts. And so I've mentioned carts a couple times because they are very expensive for us. Doctrine is doing a lot. And uh, we realized that carts were actually uh, the lion's share of our CPU time. About 40% was just spent at looking at carts, empty carts. And so the engineers like digging into the code, trying to figure out what's going on with PHP. And our VP, who is actually not here today, um, says, all right, hold up, fellas, step back, step back, step back. What do we know about the members? What do we know about how they use the cart? And it turns out we didn't know anything about how they use the cart. As it turns out, what, they, uh, what the, the numbers look like is for 100% you know, of the members that visit the site, only 5% have ever added to cart in their entire Hotlook career. And of those, only 10% have ever added to cart again. So what we decided to do is send back a cookie that says, do not look at my cart. And that is on the web client and on the mobile client. And every time you add to cart, we clear the cookie. So what does that mean? It means that we've reduced, we've essentially gotten 20-fold performance for free because we're not doing as many carts. The people that are shopping and never adding to cart, the window shoppers, they have a faster, more positive experience because they're not waiting on an empty cart call that doesn't do them any good. And the people that are adding to cart actually have a faster time adding to cart, shopping, and getting through because they're not competing with the people that are just window shoppers. And so with that, we actually were able to drop our average response times about 30 or 40%, which is significant after you bundle in all of the other stuff that we've already done. So um, that's it for me. Um, I'd like to open it up to any questions you have. Uh, I would have a slide up here for you. But uh, <laughs> you can reach me at uh, Joel E. Salas. That's on Twitter. That's on Gmail. That's on GitHub. Um, so any questions? Covered a lot of stuff. Yes. So the question is, we're talking about performance. What about scalability? How do we want to scale the hardware out? Uh, that's actually some of the stuff that I that I plan to talk about. But um, what we do is, again, using Toon D to set the, the appropriate scheduler and, and elevator settings. We also tune our file systems very, very aggressively. So PHP likes to talk to your disk. You might actually do that 100 or 200 times per, um, per web call. It'll open one to 200 files. And so if you have um, access times uh, set to write on your file system, you're going to be writing to your file system constantly, 100 times per call. And all you're doing is updating a timestamp. So what we do with our mount options on exe 4 is no A time. We disable buffers. We um, set the commit uh, time to 600 seconds. So for 600 seconds, there's volatile data that might be lost. But again, uh, we don't like to write to disk, so uh, most of the data that matters is not on that box. So that's, those are, that's how you get the same hardware to do more, basically. And again, Hello. don't virtualize. Yes, sir.
So the question was, uh, when we re-implemented our search in Scala, uh, did we consider any of the uh, existing options? So our search implementation is actually uh, leveraging Solar Cloud, and the Scala portion is the part where we take our gigantic, you know, best-in-class uh, product index, and we give you nice filtered results um, based on brands, based on uh, other uh, colors and other facets that we add, and that's what our API is doing. But we are using Solar Cloud heavily. Yes. So the question was, who in the organization actually uh, initiated the idea of tackling performance? And um, I'd like to say that, that it was the engineering group, but really it came from the product uh, team and it came from um, the, the leadership and the members. And they said, we need this to do better. And uh, we decided to tackle that as a problem. But like I said, intrinsically, we as engineers want to design things that are fast, that are efficient, that are, are well-designed, that we can be proud of. And so really, I don't think it was, it was a very difficult conversation to say, we need to tackle this problem. Um, there was a bit of, of pushback against, you know, performance is not a feature, it's not worth engineering time, but uh, we got to the point where there was an inflection and, and you know, the, the, the dollars spread themselves out. All right. All right. Uh, okay, so I'm muted. All right. Can I get a round of applause for Joel? Thank you. Appreciate it.